good morning again, everyone. And just as a reminder, if you haven't done so already, we encourage you to sign in on the attendance pads. There should be one in your section of chairs or on your row. And uh, if you are a visitor this morning, we would love to just be able to have a point of contact with you um, on these sheets, whether it's a, an email address or a street address, just so we could send you a little note this week to say thank you for being here. Um, again, we're happy to have you in worship this morning. So our scripture reading this morning comes to us from the gospel according to Luke. We read from Luke last week in the second chapter. We're going to go back to the first chapter today. Um, and this will be a familiar story to many of you or most of you. One of the things that uh, we're going to do with this story is we're going to read sort of this whole section through. So it's a little bit longer reading, but I think it'll make sense after the sermon's over why we needed to do the whole thing today. So Luke chapter 1, verse, starting with verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you, you have found favor with your God. And now you will receive, or you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born. The child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now, your relative, Elizabeth, in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who is said to have been barren. For nothing shall be impossible with God. Then Mary said, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to, do, to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. And holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm and he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to his ancestors. To Abraham and the descendants forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For those of you who are joining us for the first time this uh, Advent season, we uh, started last Sunday with a, a four-week sermon series that we're calling From Here to There. And the idea is that if we sort of dig deeper into these scripture passages, these ones that if we grew up in the Christian faith, that they are so familiar to us, if we sort of take those passages and we unvarnish them a little bit and explore and really probe perhaps what the uh, emotional state is behind the individuals involved, we will see that those stories begin in a very different place than they actually end up. And I think that you'll find that as we go through these stories, they are going to have remarkable parallels to our lives too. And even though we're removed by culture in 2,000 plus years, you'll see just how much we have in common with these people in these early stories around Jesus' birth. Again, if we take away some of the romanticized pieces of these stories 
and look at them a little bit closer, I think we're going to see ourselves in these stories. So I don't know how many of you have uh, much experience with loneliness, but uh, I think we all probably have had a time period, or maybe that's part of our, our regular experience in life, is, is feeling this, this bit of loneliness. I remember a time that I felt very lonely uh, was actually at a time when I felt like I was surrounded by people all the time. I was a senior in college. I was uh, taking a semester to do student teaching. That was, uh, was going to be plan B for me if the, the whole ministry thing didn't work out or if I felt like God was just maybe teasing me into ministry and then really wanted me in the classroom. So I was preparing to be a school teacher if it came to that, and uh, I was excited about that possibility as a career too, and moved to a, a town called La Crosse, Wisconsin, and that's where I was going to begin a semester of student teaching. I had rented the dumpiest apartment that you can imagine. When my mom actually saw it several months later, she burst into tears. It was, it was that bad. I rented this place, and I was going to live there and start teaching on Monday, and I arrived in town on a Saturday with my, my suitcase and my backpack. That next day, Sunday, that was Super Bowl Sunday. And so I did what everybody does in uh, Wisconsin, which is go downtown and find an establishment to watch the ball game. And so I went and I found and I got a table and I ordered some food and looked around this crowded bar and realized what it was like to be lonely. I mean, I'd been surrounded in college by, you know, dozens, hundreds of people at all times. And here I was now in a room, a crowded room full of people eager to cheer on the teams in the Super Bowl. And, and there I was at a table by myself and feeling really isolated, really alone, and kind of sad about it. In fact, I didn't even finish watching the game. I just ate my meal, paid my tab, and walked home. You know, this is the experience that maybe some of you are feeling, and certainly we know that people feel this time of year. It, it, it's that paradox of feeling like, oh, this is such a, a happy time of year, and that we are just like overloaded with social opportunities and together time, and yet for people that are struggling and feeling alone or isolated in the middle of all this, well, that's a familiar thing. So I wanted to look at the story of Mary's life today and just, again, take back a couple of layers of sort of the, the gloss that we put over this story. And we move in chapter one from Mary hearing this news, the enunciation of the good news, to then Mary ending the chapter singing a happy song. But I think there's a little bit in between those two parts of the story. You've heard this before, but, but consider again what we're talking about when we're thinking about Mary the person. Mary's probably between 12 and 15 years old. She is a very young woman. Life expectancy wasn't that great. She's probably, if she's 15, she's probably lived a third of her life already. Marriage in Jewish culture in biblical times worked something like this. The first thing that happened was there was an engagement. So when we say engagement, Joseph did not come in with this big rock and put it on Mary's finger. The two dads worked out this business transaction. Okay, so just remember that piece of it. Again, that's going to take your first layer of, of varnish away, right? The dads came together. They worked out some sort of an exchange, a little dowry, a little transaction. Let's set up the kids. It's going to be good for everybody involved. The next step is the betrothal. Now, that's where the bride and the groom-to-be actually get some say in the whole deal. That's the part where they come together and they say, oh, we think that this, is, this could work out. Maybe they've come to terms with what the dads agreed on, but this is the part where they say, we're going to make this promise to each other that we're gonna get married. And then lastly, the groom comes by some point, probably within a year, year and a half, and says, today's the wedding day, let's make this happen. So parts one and two of that equation have now been completed by the time that Mary gets this visit. Mary's probably at home, Maybe she's uh, uh, on the roof doing, doing wash. Maybe she's doing some other chores, building a fire in the kitchen. Who knows? She's probably doing some everyday, normal kind of thing. And then, boom, out of nowhere, Gabriel appears. And he says to her this news, right? You're pregnant. It's God's child. He's going to be the one who sits on the throne of David, and he is going to redeem the nations, and it's going to be amazing. Now, to steal from a podcast that I heard from recently that just sort of reminds us all of this, 
Do you remember in just hearing me read that story what Mary's first response is? She doesn't go, the son of God, really? She goes, I'm pregnant? It just shows you where her head is at, right? She says, how, what? The pregnancy part is where she's hung up. That's the first part of the story, that she doesn't get it. She probably thinks the rest is just a mistake. I mean, maybe it would be lovely, maybe it's scary, but it's a mistake. She can't, it can't be because, well, the necessary steps haven't happened. And so she says, how can this be? And that's where her head is at. And I can't help but think that 14-year-olds say, Mary hasn't been able to even process the rest of this. And mind you, at this moment, she doesn't sort of spring into joy and say, oh my gosh, isn't this wonderful for me? I'm so honored that I have been chosen for this. She's just silent and listens to Gabriel's words. And then Gabriel says something that I'm glad at least Mary was able to hear this. Because amidst the excitement or the just all out fear, nausea, whatever it is, that the, whatever emotion accompanied this, he also heard the last part of Gabriel's announcement, which was, oh, and you should also know that your relative Elizabeth, she is advanced in years, hasn't had a child, and you should know she's pregnant too. Now, we don't know much about this. We don't know much about uh, Elizabeth and Zachariah, we're not even exactly sure how they're related to Mary, but they are. And when they say Elizabeth's advanced in years, maybe she's late 30s, right? So we're just thinking realistically biblical times. So Mary hears this and she decides, I'm gonna go take a walk. I'm gonna go visit Elizabeth for a little while. Because I'm sure that there's a part of this that is thinking, she's thinking, nobody's gonna believe me. Do I believe it myself? I am going to be disgraced. I live in a tiny little town where everybody's all up in each other's business and they are going to think the worst of me. They're going to think that I have done something to dishonor Joseph. I have shamed my family, the whole bit. I gotta think that in this moment, Mary's here is loneliness. Nobody knows what I'm going through. Nobody's going to believe me. This is my struggle. This is my burden to bear. This is all on me. And I am feeling surrounded by a small town community and a loving family and a family to be really, really alone. And that's the paradox that we face. So many of us, sometimes at our times of greatest loneliness, it's the time that doesn't make the most sense to the people or the world around us. And yet that's the situation that we're in. You know, I, I think back on, on who some of my friends are in my life. I, I look back at my childhood friends, the high school friends, the college friends, the graduate school friends, the places that we've lived and the friends that we've made in those places. But today, when it comes to the friends that I usually want to seek out, especially when I'm feeling uh, troubled, confused, maybe isolated, you know who I seek out? I, I go to my clergy friends. You know, my clergy friends here in North Alabama, they, they have lives in some ways that are, are very different in terms of upbringing, right? We grew up in different places, grew up cheering for different football teams, you know, the things that are important. And, and those, those things uh, are differences in our lives. And so on some, on paper perhaps, it's strange that the friendship has emerged. But the thing that's so important in these situations for me is that I can go to somebody and I can sit down at lunch and meet a colleague and neither one of us has to explain what life is like to be a pastor at a church. We just don't, we don't, we don't have to go through that. Some of my closest friends from growing up, they still don't get that. One of them builds websites in his basement. Like that's different than what I do. I don't get his world and he doesn't get my world in to some degree, right? And, and so when I want to seek out somebody, when I want somebody to, to not, I don't wanna explain it all, I just want somebody on the same page with me, I seek out somebody that, that just gets it. 
And we don't have to talk about that part of it. We just get it. I think you have those people in your life too where you say they know me well enough or they understand the circumstances of my life or my workplace or my family well enough that I can just, it's so much easier just to be with them. I think that that's what Mary heard with the part about Elizabeth. Your relative is also mysteriously spiritually pregnant with a child she didn't see coming. Don't you think that that's why Mary went to Elizabeth? It's not like, oh, my favorite aunt or my closest cousin or whatever. It's No, it's somebody that understands it. It's somebody that gets it. She didn't have to explain herself to Elizabeth. And she gets there, and the response that Elizabeth is, what a blessing it is that you are here. And she doesn't say, oh, child, this is bad. Or she doesn't say, what do you mean an angel came and told you you're going to have a baby? She just gets it. She doesn't try to fix it. She's not Elizabeth the problem solver. She just says, I am taking your hand and I am going to walk with you for the next three months or until you are ready to go home and face what comes next. She's just there. And what a gift that is. I think it's what we strive for in terms of what it means to be a good friend. I think it's what we look for when we are in one of those places of loneliness. What we are really searching for in those moments is a place of comfort. It's not a fix it, it's not take it away from me, it's not help me forget it, it's that just be with me, be present, walk with me, comfort me in this moment. I don't know how many of you saw this, but there was a a picture that was posted in the news on some news sites this week. Uh, One of the the young men who was murdered this week in in Oxford, Michigan, signed on his driver's license that he was an organ donor. And as it works, when when somebody has their organs harvested, they're taken from, often from the place in in the morgue to the place where, or or perhaps in in the ICU, where they then go to, into a surgery unit so that these organs can be harvested. And at this community hospital, there were two different parts of the building and they were connected by a sky bridge. And hundreds and hundreds of people from the community did a candlelight vigil underneath that sky bridge in that courtyard. I'm sure most of them had really little connection to the, the family of the, the boy who was killed. But what they wanted was when the family crossed that sky bridge accompanying the body of their son, if they looked out of the corner of the eye, they would see hundreds or thousands of people below standing in support with them, not fixing it, not making it all better, not making it go away, not making them forget it, but just saying, we may not know, but we're here with you. I think that's what we're really looking for. I think that's when we're feeling lonely, what we, just, we just want that comfort. And I think that when the church behaves at its best, that's what the church seeks to be for one another. We walk with each other through these times. We come to one another's side. We don't make it go away, we don't make it better, but we make it bearable because we stand there with one another in solidarity, in support, in love. We just do all that we can just to say, I'm walking with you during this time and I want to bring you some measure of comfort. And when that happens, we move from here to there. And as evidence in the biblical story, what happens is after Elizabeth welcomes Mary with open arms, Mary begins to recognize that she is not alone in all of this. And over time, she begins to understand that what is taking place with all of the uncertainty, with all the the fear and trepidation involved in this, there is something that is beautiful in this moment. And this is when she turns to the words that we know as the Magnificat, and she says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, 
my Savior. It's a movement from where we started to where we're headed. It's a process as we are in from Advent, from this time of preparation to the time of receiving the good news of the birth of Jesus. It doesn't mean that everything is right in the world, but it does mean that with God at our side, we are moving in that direction. And it means that in our loneliness, we can seek comfort. And if that's your story here today, if you have come feeling lonely and isolated, I hope that in the church, and in this church in particular, you will find a measure of comfort. And for those of you who have arrived comfortable today, by all means, have your eyes, your ears, and most of all, your hearts open for those around you that may be struggling right now and to say, I am with you. I can't fix it. I don't fully understand it. But I'm committing to walking with you. This is the movement. This is what Mary was seeking. This is what Elizabeth provides, and this is what the church can be about. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for all the people who have been there for us, the ones that arrived at just the right time, the ones who seem to appear to us out of nowhere and to say, I'm with you. For those people who have arrived in those moments, we give you thanks. We thank you for a story that, as seasonally uplifting as it is, we also know that there's greater depth, layers, and complexity to it as well. We thank you for the opportunity to look deep into these stories and realize that these characters who seem so far removed from us are actually a lot more like us than we may have realized. And we thank you once again that we know that you often do your greatest work in the times of our greatest need, collectively and individually. And we thank you for that as well. So we lift all of these things up in the name of your precious Son, our Savior, the one whose birth we prepare for today. And we say thank you. Amen. Amen.